Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming the star of a cult horror movie franchise. There was only two of them, but it seems like that there was more because they were so damn good. And I'm talking about Bobby Ray Schaefer. Yes, Bobby Ray Schaefer, the psycho cop himself. And, of course, you all know him from The Office, the, cla- the, the now classic sitcom. And I'm having him on the show today to talk about um, making those movies, talking about uh, um, The Office, and some other things he did, too. He played a commercial director in both Echo Park and Hollywood Shuffle. And I want to know why he played a commercial director in both movies. He was also in uh, The Corporate Ladder with um, uh, my friend and guest Kathleen Kinmont. And uh, he was also in Pee-wee's Big Holiday. I'm going to find about find out about all that stuff today. And it's going to be pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Bobby Ray Schaefer. Hello. Hey, Bobby Ray, welcome to the show. Are we already on, Tommy? Yes, we are. <laughs> I like that. Just dive right in. Yeah. Back from the past. Yeah, I've never been one of those guys who, um, you know, calls the guest and then does the intro because I think it's a complete waste of time. <laughs> gotcha. Yes. Deal. And it's such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Well, my pleasure. We're talking about me, I assume, so yeah. it's my favorite topic. <laughs> awesome. So... <laughs> Going back in time, um, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? No, never. I, I, uh, I, I remember I auditioned for a play one time, and, uh, and I did one role in fifth grade, but it was never uh, a thing for me. I was a basketball player. I wasn't really interested in anything but basketball and cheerleaders. <laughs> Not necessarily in that order. Yeah. <laughs> You're pretty good at basketball? I was pretty good, yes. Um, I loved it. I mean, it. Uh, I could go and play by myself, you know, and it was just time. Uh, now I've replaced it with golf. You know, uh, yeah. I like to go to the putting green and just stop thinking and, uh, you know, make the shot. Yeah. What position did you play? Well, it depended on the team I was on. I played guard, forward, and center. Um, at, at center, I was 6'4", six, 6'5", six, so really, really small. <laughs> I remember <laughs> playing against the seven-foot-one guy in, in the Detroit uh, State Finals, and uh, that was uh, that was a pleasant experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, basketball was never my game. My dad used to take me to go play it, and I was just always a pussy that the ball was going to hit me in the face. <laughs> oh yeah, no, you get hit in the face for sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you 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 never did like um, uh, community theater or school plays or any of that though. No, no, I I um, I got involved in acting uh, when I was twenty three years old. So I was a, a late comer to the game. Mm-hmm. Um, I was out here. I was you know working as a model every now and then. And uh, I fell in love with an actress, and she got me uh, interested in acting. And uh, so I went to school and learned how to learn how to act. Because <laughs> believe it or not, it is a craft. And uh, you know, the rest is history, as they say. Forty years later. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, who did you uh, study with? Well, there was a teacher in the '80s who was the top teacher in LA. Her name was Peggy Fury. Mm-hmm. Uh, people in my class were Meg Ryan, Nick Cage, John Penn, oh. Joe Pfeiffer. I mean, on and on and on. It was all the young upcoming talent at the time, and it was uh, very competitive. She was a Stanislav teacher. She came from uh, the acting studio in New York. She had been a teacher to uh, James Dean and Marlon Brando, a couple of pretty good American actors. Yeah. So we had this connection to the actor's studio. And we studied playwrights. I mean, uh, one semester it would be Tennessee Williams, then the next one would be the English playwright Harold Pinter. I mean, it was a, uh, it was about theater. So uh, you learn that foundation, of course, and then you uh, naturally can adapt that uh, to film and television. They're all different disciplines, but the foundation for building characters as 
we like to say in my trade, is, is uh, the same. Mm -hmm. Wow, so that's a lot of great like students in your class <laughs> that went on to become huge. Yeah, no, it was uh, Eric Stoltz. I mean, I could go on and on with these people, uh, and it, it was great to to see them. Uh, you know, uh, as we've all sort of meandered along the way. Mm -hmm. Did you ever take a class for uh, uh, Milton Casellas? No, I'm familiar with that technique. Though I, I have a lot of friends who are, were, you know, huge uh, Casellas fan. I met him. I went to his theater over here in North Hollywood and watched the plays done. Uh, you know, any, anywhere you learn a discipline, uh, you know, everyone wants the stuff for their guru, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the loyalty to the guru is all encompassing out here. And uh, so I'm a fan of uh, actors who learn, you know, how to actually do the craft. The thing, the game has changed a lot, Tommy, because everybody has a camera now and everybody thinks that, you know, they've got to do it. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I would say, hey, uh, Flav of Flav thinks he's an actor, right? Yeah. Well, so does Anthony Hopkins, right? So who <laughs> who has the uh, most technique there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what what guy has the clock around his back? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's good acting and bad acting. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, and it, it's not that hard to tell which is which, you know. So right. Um, that was always my interest. I was always interested in acting, you know. What I mean, so that's really been my thing. I, I like the. I like parts. I'm interested in parts. I'm, uh, you know, that's what motivates me. Um, so, uh, you know, on to the next one. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who did study other, uh, under Milton Casalis, and uh, I had this one guest. She said, she said, I'll admit I studied under uh, Milton Casalis, but I'm not a Scientologist. <laughs> yeah, that was the creepy part of the equation. Uh, I never really liked that. Uh, you know, I had a yeah. girlfriend who who kind of got sucked in there for a while and finally got out of the cult. But um, that always unnerved me. And I, there was an acting teacher I remember back in the day. And her, in her class, you weren't allowed to, if you got booked in a movie or something, you weren't allowed to do it until you were out of the class. So I'm like, that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> would agree to that. Uh, I, I would. I'm going to say yes to the to the movie. Thank you very much. Yeah, the the, the teacher is getting paid uh, is getting paid, but not the student. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not in the call that deep. Yeah, <laughs> that's insane. Wow. So uh, your first movie was the Rosebud Beach Hotel. That's right. Good yeah. research there, uh, with a great horror icon, Mr. Christopher Lee. Yeah. So that was intim that was intimidating. <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, actually, he was great. You know, I was just in awe because uh, I I knew who he was by that point. You mm -hmm. know, when, when I was starting out, I didn't really know much about film at all. I mean, I didn't know the history or anything. I, I hadn't watched a lot of movies when I was a kid, and um, you know, because like I said, I was out there playing basketball <laughs> <laughs> and chasing cheerleaders. Uh, but uh, what, the actress was Colleen Camp. My first scene, yeah. uh, I had with Colleen Camp, and she was I was hot off of Apocalypse Now, and so that was a big deal. You know, she was smoking hot, mm -hmm. and, and so uh, I go to do the scene, and I was supposed to shoot it at noon. My call was at noon, and I actually didn't shoot till eight p.m. and it was the last shot of the day. And so the crew was surly, and I was a rookie. And right before the uh, before we shot the scene, the director comes up to me, takes the script out of my hand, and he says, "Forget that. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, just forget all that. Don't do any of that. Just you know." And I'd been that was my lifeline, you know. Was that yeah. script? I mean, I'd been working on those words nonstop. So uh, it took eighteen takes for me to get that scene. <laughs> <laughs> And I was just devastated, you know, because I sucked. You know, I was, uh, it was terrible. And so uh, on the way home, I, I was, you know, uh, all, all messed up. And I got home, and the director called me up, and he said, look, uh, you know, everybody has to lose their ch 
cherry one way. So I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Get over it. You know, good job. We got it. So <laughs> it was not much of a storybook entrance into the uh, profession. Yeah. I, I used to see this movie on USA up all night back in the nineties. And, um, I, I always like how the movie has such a great cast. You got Peter Scolari coming off of Bosom Buddies, um, Eddie Deason, Hank Garrett. I'm going to be interviewing him soon. Um, oh, yeah. No, the cast is just a who's who of character actors. Chuck McCann. From Chuck the McCann. I mean, it, it was, uh, they were all friends of Harry Hurwitz, who was the director. And Harry had, uh, he was a screenwriter mostly. He had written uh, Death Race. Uh, Death Race was his movie. He wrote, co wrote that. And he uh, wrote The Projectionist. And The Projectionist is a great cult film. Uh, the editing job that he did in that is just legendary. And uh, so, you know, you know there was, these were pros, pros. <laughs> yeah. And there I was. <laughs> but I looked good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also a very young friend, Drescher. That's right. That's right. Wow, the Rosebud Beach Hotel. That was one crazy hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Gabrielle Monique, she like disappeared off the face of the earth. She was hot in those uh, days. I, I ran into the, 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 and there were the, the two uh, comedy guys were in that. Uh, what were their names? They were the brothers something. Um, and, and Marie and Cherie Curie, the band The Runaways, they, they were in that. Yeah. Uh, rocking out on the beach. Big seat on the beach with Christopher Lee. Yeah, <laughs> that's so awesome. Yeah. How how did you? Know, you oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask, how did you manage to play a commercial director in both Echo Park and Hollywood Shuffle? Well, it's just the way it, the way it broke. You know, I mean, it, mm-hmm. I had no, <laughs> I had no <laughs> control over what I was getting in those days. I just said yes to everything. Yeah, uh, but the the second one at Echo Park that was a really great experience because I the director was a, a um, Austrian guy uh, Robert Dornhelm and so when I showed up on the set he said okay there's your crew there's your cast make a commercial so that was fun and then the commercial plays inside the movie that was the commercial that I made so that you know I really did get to live the uh, director role there but it was funny because when I made Psycho Cop uh, that those two credits were on the box because you had to have, <laughs> you know, I didn't have, I had three movie credits when I made Psycho Cop, so they put those two on there and it's a commercial director. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, Echo Park, I remember that movie so well because Susan Day gets naked. <laughs> well, Susan Day was my girlfriend. Susan Day was how I got into the business, Tommy. Oh, so she's the one who, um, who got you, who got you into acting. Then. That's right. Wow. We lived together for five years until she dumped me for a movie producer, <laughs> a rich old movie producer. Damn him! Wow, she she you know I used to see her on talk shows. She she was always just so deep and insightful and very free spirited. She seemed like is that yes, pretty? Yes, pretty so far she, off. She's a she's a, she's a good woman, and uh, I, I was a fan of her work. Uh, you know, obviously, a, yeah. a staunch defender. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. She's the, one, she's the one that got away, you know, so uh, none of them have really measured up to her since. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're getting a lot of confessions here. I, I haven't told that to anybody. So. <laughs> well, how, how was it working uh, with uh, Robert Townsend on Hollywood Shuffle? That was great. Great experience. Uh, because we were just winging it, you know, that we, we were making it on a hope and a prayer. Nobody was getting paid. We were doing it because Robert asked us to. It was a good get. And uh, I cracked him up. You know, I I crushed him and I did some improv on him when we were shooting the uh, scene at the end of the movie. And uh, he walks out onto the set and I'm playing the director in that. And I say, makeup, wardrobe. When we need some effort scene, he looks positively nappy. (laughs) So (laughs) that wasn't in the script. He wasn't expecting it, you know. And, uh, the whole set was just, it was just this really sort of this tense silence. Because <laughs> everybody was like, what did he just say? And uh, all of a sudden, Robert thought it was funny, and he started laughing. And then from that point on, every time we walked up uh, to the mark, getting ready to do this, we would look at each other and just bust out laughing. So it took a long time to get the uh, giggles under control. But once we did, uh, you know, he has 
the great line there. Remember, you can't take pride in your job. There's always work at the post office. <laughs> <laughs> How does um, a psycho cop come into your life? Well, that was, you know, an ad in uh, an actor's weekly called Backstage West. Oh, yeah. I put, in, I put a picture in an envelope. I sent it in. A week later, I get a call, come in for the audition. I go to the audition, and, it, you know, as luck would have it, uh, the audition material was Sam Shepard's play, True West, <laughs> which <laughs> I love that play. And later, I did the 20th anniversary of it out in Pasadena, where Shepard wrote it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I knew it cold, and all the other actors, I could hear them butchering it, you know, because Shepard's really hard to do. Yeah. And, I had just seen Malkovich and Sinise do it. That was the, the uh, piece that made their careers. Both of them uh, was True West. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I nailed it because <laughs> I knew it. Like I, I'd been working on it in that in Peggy Fury's class, even though I was too young to do it at the time that I was working on it. Uh, you know, like I said later, I was able to get to do it, and uh, it really, I don't know, probably the most fun part I've ever done. Yeah. Do you know if there was any other guys that had been considered for the role? Uh, I don't know. There were other people, but uh, they offered it to me. And uh, then it took about three months to get it off the ground. Uh, it actually included <laughs> Cassie <laughs> Nelway is, uh, is the producer of the film. Yeah. And so he never even, I don't think he ever read the script. He, he just, uh, he loved the title. <laughs> so they, the other producer uh, on the film was Jessica Raines, who was Claude Raines' daughter. Oh. That was a great, I'm a huge Claude Raines fan. Yeah. So, great. I mean, Invisible Man, uh, say no more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Casablanca, he's pretty good at Casablanca, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a couple of credits for you. So, um, he, they say to me, uh, the director, Wallace Potts, and, and Jessica Raines, they said, listen, we need to get Cassie in off, you know, make him uh, go ahead and get us the money. So why don't you uh, get the costume and go over to his office and uh, get him to make it. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> so I rented the costume. I went to Western Costume. It cost me 100 bucks to rent it. But I was determined. And uh, so I, went, I showed up. I, I, he didn't even know I was showing up. I showed up in in the outfit and I came into his office and I, you know, acted tough for about half an hour or so. <laughs> <laughs> and he, I went maybe a little psycho too. And he finally said, okay, we'll make it. So, uh, we were shooting probably, you know, a couple weeks later. Wow. Yeah. It's funny. This movie holds up because it's, it's more, it's more, um, Re relevant today because it's, it's kind of like a commentary on how cops abuse their power. Really? Yeah. So, yeah, I think, you know, I, I've never been a big fan of, of, of people with power who misuse it. Yeah. Only a Satanist as a policeman <laughs> 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 would be, would be uh, true to that. Uh, I, I know, I think I could go ahead and tell you here, Tommy, that I've written Psycho Cop 3. Mm -hmm. It's, it's called Hip Hop Psycho Cop, and it's current. Yeah. We, uh, we are very much in the arena that you're discussing. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's taking phone calls from Satan on his iPhone, so. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, have you, have you gotten a green light? Well, we had a screening of Psycho Cop 2 last weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, it was great. It, it crushed. We had the uh, the new print from uh, or the new Blu-ray from uh, Vinegar Syndrome, and so we screened it. The screening house was packed. The new screening house in Hollywood. Adam Rifkin was there. Um, also, William Lustig, who directed a little series called Maniac Cop. Yeah. <laughs> and so I had never met Mr. Lustig before. So me and Rifkin and him were in the lobby before the screening and mm -hmm. I told him, I said, you know, for the last 25 years, <laughs> people have been coming up to me and saying, who would win, Maniac Cop or Psycho Cop? 
And I said, you know what I tell him? He goes, no, who, what? I said, you're looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was beautiful. <laughs> oh, man, that's Boom. awesome. Boom, there you go. That's called the knockout punch right there. Yeah. <laughs> well, the movie crushed it. So afterwards, uh, Adam Rifkin's producer, who just did his Burt Reynolds movie, The Last Movie Star, yes. came running up to me after the movie and said, you know, I told Adam, uh, right after I, uh, this is, you know what we should be doing? We should be doing Psycho Cop 3. I'm like, funny you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> because I happen to have already written the screenplay. I'll send it to you. Yeah. So he's got it. Oh, that's awesome. God, I'm be- just waiting to hear how they want to produce it. I mean, do we want to crowdfund it? Do we want to just raise the money ourselves? I mean, there's distributors here who'd be happy to, uh, happy to take that project on. Oh, yeah. It's got such a huge cult following. Okay, an audience. And, you know, the, the thing that made me write Psycho Cop 3 was, first of all, who could do it better than me? No one. Answer no one. But the reviews on the Blu-ray re-release a year ago were so amazingly good that I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. The times that we were with with live audience, it just completely, it's still great. I mean, it doesn't feel like it's stuck in 93 at all. You know, it's yeah. still, uh, all the jokes are still there and everything. Uh, it's great to see the violence restored uh, finally. You know, it was <laughs> terrible to watch it on cable all those years ago <laughs> when they just butchered the cut. I mean, even the first DVD release of it, the cut, just, you know, an 85 minute version that right. really stuck. I mean, it, it's, you can't even watch it. I mean, I, I don't think I did uh, maybe more than once or twice over the, you know, 20 years. Yeah. How, how come there wasn't any more after the second one, though? Well, well, you know, that's the producer's decision. I mean, yeah. it was a, he, it, what happened at that point in time was that he quit being a producer and he went to work at the William Morris Agency as an agent. He went there, Cassian became the uh, independent film agent at William Morris. Mm-hmm. He actually ended up, when he got back into the producer's game, he won the Academy Award for Dallas Buyers Club. So, you know, that's pretty awesome when a little $6 million film can go win that big boy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite kill in uh, either of the movies? Oh, I, I don't know. I like breaking Julie Strange's neck. That was that's pretty fun. I, I like uh, the yeah, I like in the first one when you like you got hold her hold of her by the neck and you just basically snap her neck. <laughs> yeah, you know, good good clean kill. I mean, um, you know, our, our our violence is pretty harmless, really, when you compare it to you know some of the gore porn that's out there. Yeah, late. you know, I, I like a good scare uh, with my violence, but not a lingering sort of you know reveling in it. I did a movie a few years ago, well, 10 years ago now, called Knife Point, which mm-hmm. was a home invasion robbery. Uh, and it was just brutal. <laughs> I mean, reveling in, you know, I get my, I get my fingers cut off in it. They, you know, ass rape me with a 38. I mean, there's lots of good <laughs> stuff. And, yeah. Uh, so, you know, the problem was that I didn't trust the act of doing the ass rape. And, you know, I was like, I don't do not trust this guy. <laughs> like, you really want to have somebody you can trust in that scene. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's funny. You, you mentioned uh, Julie Strain. Uh, you know that, that, that hoax that happened recently? Well, no, I heard that she, people, what they say, she was dead. Yeah, and then they said that she wasn't like like an hour later or something. Well, no, but she's uh, very, very sick. I believe with it, it's oh, Alzheimer's. Yeah, yeah. She, I did. So I did. That's, that's what Adam told me uh, last weekend. Yeah, I do know she was sick, but um, God, that, that that was just insane, you know. And I really did. I really did, you know, feel bad, you know, when I when I thought she was dead, and then an hour later, it's just like, oh my God, why can't the the news get it straight? You know, <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, I was curious, where did you guys shoot the first one at? 
Well, uh, it was shot in Encino, uh, the the house, and then the um, the rest of it was out in Malibu Canyon, mm-hmm. and so it, Malibu Canyon is typically <laughs> ten to, to twenty degrees colder than the rest of LA County. Yeah, uh, just just the way the winds come whipping off the ocean there, and get trapped and boxed in that canyon. So we were shooting all nights, and you know we really earned our strikes on that one. I mean, it, it was a labor of love for sure. Yeah, pure de- total devotion. I mean, when you when you're on that schedule, you know we shot those movies, both of them in in twelve days each. You know, so wow, two six two six day weeks. So you just totally all you do is live the movie. I mean, you eat, mm-hmm. you sleep and eat and shoot. That's it. So that's I, that, I like working that way. You know, like fast and furious. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was telling somebody the other day in an interview, I did Pee Wee's Big Holiday. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, you know, those are great people to work with. And, you know, it's so leisurely. <laughs> Big studio films. I mean, there's no urgency. You know, it's like, those, if we shot two pages, everybody's like, okay, great day. <laughs> you know, you come off the of independent films, you're used to doing 15 pages a day. So you, you do two pages, you're hanging out all day, you know, eating, you know, at the craft service table, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Call me when they're ready. I'll be in my trailer, you know. Yeah. So. <laughs> you worked uh, with another guest of mine, uh, Kathleen Kinmont, on The Corporate Ladder. How was that experience? Well, that was great. I mean, I love Kathleen. I've worked with Kathleen on other things as well. Uh-huh. Uh, I did I did her directing debut, a little horror thing called Mrs. Sweeney. Uh, short film that she uh, wrote, produced, and directed. Uh, I played the bad daddy in that. Uh, in Corporate Ladder, I rape her. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a beautiful scene. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you know, it was great. I always tell people, I, I had a couple of nips of uh, uh, VO, as I recall, but, you know, before, I want her to smell the alcohol because the scene was, uh, I was her boss and I raped her. She's my secretary, and then she kills me. She, uh, you know, she knocks me out the window, <laughs> take this long fall. And uh, so it was great because I throw her down, and I was saying all this crazy stuff to her, like, now it's time to thank daddy. <laughs> <laughs> You're nothing but a lousy secretary without me. Now come here. And so, it, you know, we did multiple takes on it, and then I throw her down and rape her. And so uh, after after each take was over, she would come up to me and go, that was great, Bobby. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> Can we, let's, let's do another one. Let's do one more of those. So, uh, good clean fun. And uh, the movie was produced by Playboy Channel. Yeah. And uh, Brad Cravoy, uh, there's some big producers who, who were up and coming at the time, were, were producers on it. And so when they watched the first take, they were like, oh, no way. <laughs> this is way too violent, way too realistic. The, the director writer was, is Nick Vallelonger, who just won uh, two Academy Awards for uh, Green Book, mm-hmm. writer and producer. He's also Mike in Psycho Cop Returns. I got him his first directing job with that. And he did Brilliant Disguise, was the name of the movie. And... Uh, so he had to cut the scene because <laughs> it was too, it, you know, it was too disturbing. They were like, you can't use this rape scene. I mean, it opens the movie. So I got the footage from it, cut to, I get the footage, and I put it on my demo reel. And I proudly take it over to my agent. I go home. I get a call about an hour later. I'm like, they're like, hey, Bobby, <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> you can use this rape scene to open up your demo reel. The, 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 Bobby, how many casting directors are women? What's the percentage? I'm like, well, 75, 80%. <laughs> like, well, uh, this rape scene, uh, in fact, we don't even, I'm like, it's beautiful. <laughs> They're like, no, nah, we, we better get it off the reel. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised that Kathleen like doing that scene. Every time she's on the podcast, you know, she has this balance between being very well-read and articulate, but also being very politically incorrect. <laughs> well, she's saucy. Let's just say she's saucy and leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. 
I love her though. She's a lot of fun. Yeah, she is. How did uh, the office come to you? Well, like everything else, I auditioned for it. I mean, and uh, and won the battle. I mean, that was uh, that was you know the big get. That was the life changer for sure. Yeah. And, uh, a fortunate, you know, fate, fate, destiny, uh, right place, right time, and I had the goods. <laughs> that, that's what it comes down to. Phyllis also made the decision. You know, she was there on the callback day, and there were some hitters there that day after this role. I mean, you know, it's network television. Uh, if you ever, there, there's tapes that go around of all the people who tried out for the show and didn't get it. You know, Seth Ro- uh, Rogan and all those people who were auditioning for it. Mm-hmm. Um, the part of Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration, was originally intended for one of the producers. As you know, there were a ton of writer-producers on the show. Yeah. I think five of them. Yeah. And so that's, that makes for an interesting dynamic. Um, you know, but again, it's network television, so, um, you know, the network <laughs> and the producers, I mean, it's a writer's medium uh, as much as it's... Um, what we had that happen on that show, Tommy, is just a convergence of great writing and great talent, and it all, my God, who could have predicted that it would still be writing the top? <laughs> it was pop charts. Go figure. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see the British version first? I'm sorry? Did you see the British version first? Uh, I, no, no. Everybody asked me that. I, I watched maybe a half an hour of it. I mean, I like British comedy. It's, you know, yeah. American comedy. But that show, I mean, we we made 187 episodes. I mean, they only made, what, 11 of them or something? Yeah, and that's what they do in England. Content, we just, you know, blew by that right away. Yeah. I think Steve Carell, too, He I think he, he bit off more than he can chew because, you know, he does the pilot. Then he does the forty-year-old virgin, which was a pet project, the labor of love of his, and then you know they both come out simultaneously, and they're so huge. I think he was under a lot of pressure to you know succeed in both mediums. Well, the forty-year-old virgin saved the office. The office, after the first six episodes of season one, was the lowest-rated show in NBC history at two point one well, person I, rating. I didn't realize and that. So, over the course of the summer, the four-year-old virgin came out and was a hundred million dollar hit. So mm-hmm. now suddenly they go, well, wait a minute, <laughs> we might have something here. So season two was when I came in, uh, episode 10, and that was when the show got picked up for the rest of the season. Then what happened was our executive producer, Ben Silverman, became the president of NBC Entertainment, and he still owned the office. So that worked out pretty well. And also, after season two, we won the Emmy for Best Comedy. So right right there, right, you know, things turned around a little, yeah. a lot. So, you know, the rest is history. Yeah, I mean, his schedule just must have been insane, though, you know, doing that show and doing movies simultaneously, too. Well, you yeah, know? I mean, he... He's very judicious. I mean, when he first started out, the they, that was when they did Little Miss Sunshine, and that was during the break. Yeah. And you know, so Little Miss Sunshine was was a monster hit because they they made that movie themselves, right? Mm-hmm. The, the talent and that they pooled their resources. It was a six million dollar make, and they screened it in Park City at the film festival the first night, and the bidding war started. I mean, they were in profit. The first day, I mean, they sold it for nine million plus. You know, their interest in in the gross receipt. So mm-hmm. <laughs> everybody was happy. <laughs> you know, that was involved in that project. That was a winner. And uh, you know, it, during breaks, he would go shoot something. But um, you know, when he retired from the show after season seven, I congratulated him, and that was not the feeling on the set. I think I was the only one yeah. who said that to him. I said, congratulations, you've done all you can do with this part. I'm happy for you. And, you know, he was like, thanks so much. Because he had done everything you could do with it. I said, you know, at this point, you're just repeating yourself. I mean, uh, uh, even Yul Brenner used to be famous. 
famous for a, a stage play called The King and I. Yeah. You know, he did it for years. <laughs> it was a great show. Everybody loved it. I mean, the run of this thing. He did it for like 11 years, and then finally he was like, okay, I can't do it anymore. That's it. Yeah. And then, you know, 10 years later, he went back to it, and he started doing it again. So I think there's a lot of office fans who would, you know, dream of uh, Steve coming back to do it, but I think the chances of that <laughs> slim and uh, yeah, and now you know all the sitcoms that are that that are on. You know they got like twelve series regulars because they don't want to fall into that. You know what what Bruce Willis did on Moonlighting, where they had to like you know alter the schedule so he could make movies. Well, they don't. They won't do that now. I mean, the, you know, I, I mean that's one thing I tell people. They don't realize. I mean, Steve Carell still works for somebody. You know, yeah. I remember on the on the set him saying to people, "Listen, I, I need you to bump me. I can't come in until eight thirty. And they're like, "No, sorry, pal. <laughs> You're first up. You need to be here at six thirty. Can't change it." And he's still an employee, so he's got to be there at six thirty. Yeah. You know, he's the star. You still have obligations. You still somebody's still signing a check to you. <laughs> you know. <laughs> He's outside of the checks. Yeah. And Ken Quapis, he directed the pilot in the finale. What was he like to work with? I did another episode with him. I think I think I did, uh, uh, I can't remember. There, there was a couple of them. He, he, he's fine. He's good. He has a good, you know, eye for comedy. I mean, the, the directing job on The Office is, you know, it's one of those kind of shows that sort of directs itself. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, the directors were directing as a guest director is a lot different than, you know, being a director in a rotation, say, on Criminal Minds. I mean, the, the directors on that are all the executive producers and the producers, right? Yeah. And they, they get that payday for themselves. They do, you know, a couple episodes. They farm out the episodes at the beginning of the year. Who's going to direct this? And they're not going outside the family to get the talent. So... We did, you know, there were, uh, Harold Ramis came and directed, I mean, there were big film directors came and directed, and that, that's yeah. because they wanted the credit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't blame them. But, you know, there's great storytelling. At one point, right after we won the Emmy, Carol mm-hmm. Burnett at that Emmy Award ceremony, she said to Greg Daniels, the producer of the show, I want to be on The Office. Well, I was like, oh, that'd be awesome to get Carol Burnett. <laughs> Who would want Carol Burnett? Yeah. So Greg Daniels said, "No, we can't. We can't get Carol Burnett because that would destroy the reality that we've created. That it's Grand Pennsylvania and it's a paper company. No, she's too big a star. We can't have big stars on this show. The show's real, real people. Well, that lasted <laughs> till Kathy Bates, Will Ferrell, Tiffin, Timmy Olyphant. I mean, on and on and on. It was a parade of guest stars there." Yeah. So, and the movie, we can't have movie stars. That flew out the window. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, let's get Carol Burnett. She could be Bob Vance's uh, secretary. Let's get Carol Burnett. Yeah. Who would want to work with Carol Burnett? I'd like to do that. Yeah, it was like Batman in the 60s. Everybody wanted to be on that show. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, there was the comedy. They doing great stuff. Yeah. So, so how did you get to be in uh, Pee Wee's Big Holiday? Well, I auditioned. <laughs> <laughs> I went in and I read for part, I read for The Farmer, and a couple weeks later I get a, a call to come in and read for the construction worker. So um, I just, you know, I, I won the job. That's all. They, they were determined to put me in the movie. So it was fun. I like Pee Wee. Yeah, I bet Paul Rubens last year at Monster Palooza. He's a great guy. Very great guy. And yeah, he's, I saw- uh, he's, he's running around doing some Pee Wee stuff. Uh, a friend of mine just said she's going to see you know, their screening of yeah. uh, one of the movies, and he'll be there. And so, you know, he's uh, working the character that, that brought him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great, too. Yeah, I saw the movie, and I was like, is that Bobby Ray? <laughs> Yeah, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any upcoming projects you could talk about? Well, you know, I'm still fogging Dick Dixer a little bit. That's the movie that I made uh, came out last year. 
it's a comedy uh, mockumentary, uh, office style, obviously. It's about a Hollywood uh, horror film director who's forced to remake his only hit horror film into porn. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that sounds like it's going to be awesome. Well, I'll send you a link to it, Tommy, and you can uh, just promise me one thing. Uh-huh. Don't do any drinking games around the, the words Dick Dickster, because you won't make it. You'll die of alcohol poisoning in the first act of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> we, we say his name all the time, Dick Dickster, Dick Dickster. That's easy. I don't drink, so. <laughs> Good for you, me either. Yeah. So uh, March uh, 20th to the 22nd, you'll be at New Jersey HorrorCon. Is this your first time going to that show? Uh, is that, are you sure about those dates? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. this is my first time going to, uh, you know, I haven't really done these uh, horror. It's the 27th through the 29th is in New Jersey. Oh, I thought it was the, the, the other way around. I'm sorry. No worries. We, want, you know, we don't want anybody to drive all the way from Reddick, California to New Jersey for this horror con and, and miss the show. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish I was going to this show. I've, I've never even been to New Jersey. It's the, I have a, a friend who went there and she said uh, three. there's three words to describe um, New Jersey. Dingy, smelly, and racist. <laughs> wow, that sounds like a paradise. Yeah. <laughs> do you, so, so you don't do a whole lot of these conventions? No, uh, but I'm going to start doing a few of them. Uh, I've got one in um, Beckley, West Virginia, which is West Virginia's my home state, so that's a good one. And then there's a couple more. Uh, there's a couple more set up. Um, yeah, no. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, awesome. Yeah, if you get uh, booked in California, you know, I'll be there because I go, you know, everywhere around California for conventions. You know, I should probably talk to our friend Ronnie Angel about these conventions. He knows a lot about that stuff. Love Ronnie. Yeah, he knows uh, He knows a lot of people. Yeah, he should be treated a lot better than he does, Like just like I should be tr- treated a lot better than I do with the uh, convention circuit, but, you know, it's the nature of the business, unfortunately. But, yeah, definitely. Well, they're promoters, and, and really, you know, they're bottom line guys. Uh, you know, the money's tight. Yeah. Um, I, I don't envy promoters in this game. Uh, yeah. But, you know, you if you're going to run a business, you got to run a business. I, I did one down in San Antonio not too long ago, and, and it was really disappointing because the guy just wasn't able to generate any any crowds, you know. So there's a, it, it's, it's no fun. When there's people, it's fun. If you don't bring the crowd, then what's the point? Yeah, I th- I definitely yeah I definitely agree on that um, though. But yeah, so if if you ever get booked in California, I will be there. I will. I will. I'll let you know. I'm sure that you know. I'll put it on that old Facebook. Awesome, awesome. Well, Bobby Ray, you have yourself a great time there, and you have a great rest of your day, and I thank you for coming on today. I appreciate it, Splat, from the past. (laughs) All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Bobby Ray Schaefer. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, my God. Bobby Ray Schaefer, funny guy. Uh... Has a dark sense of humor. I love it. And, uh, yeah, if he gets booked in cons, I will, in California, I will be there. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.